didn't stop. You stopped talking. How about that? We're glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, you know, there, are, there are a lot of things going on that uh, are affecting our world today. Those of you who are praying for the family with the little girl that got hit by the car, God decided he needed her. So uh, continue to pray for the family. It's got to be awfully hard. Um, also, uh, Gary and Linda were just sharing with us that somebody they know was in an ATV accident last night and went off 20 foot cliff and got hurt pretty badly and their whole family was there to see it happen and, and uh, we need to pray for them. Also, there are people in our world and people in our, our church and people in our community that just need touch from God. They need God's watch care over their lives. And, you know, a lot of times we don't share the personal things that are going on with other people. We don't, uh, we don't know why we don't, but sometimes we just don't. And God never meant for us to walk by ourselves. He's always there with us, but that's why we have a church family, and that's why we come together and we pray for one another, and we care about one another, and we love one another. And so uh, let's go to the Lord this morning, and we're going to have a little nostalgia worship time this morning, uh, some goodies and oldies and things like that. Uh, so I hope that you'll open your heart to God. I know that sometimes, you know, people go to church and the music is not their favorite part, but we're supposed to praise God. And we can praise Him with contemporary music. We can praise Him with some kicked up older songs too. So I hope that your heart and your mind are ready to be in God's presence this morning and that you'll allow Him to give you everything that you need to get through today. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Father, we pray for those who have had grievous losses happen in their lives this week. We know that you're the God of all comfort and Lord, I know that people usually don't think this way, but your word says since the 139th Psalm that you know how many days we have on this earth before we ever get the first one. And Father, it doesn't normally matter how we end up leaving this world, but you've already interacted with that moment, and that's how you can comfort people. And Lord, we thank you for being a God who cares about us, who loves us, who gives us strength, who gives us the ability to hold on to you tightly when... We don't know what else to do. Uh, Lord, I pray that as we're here today, that everyone that's here would open their hearts and their minds to the possibility that you'll speak to them through your word and through these songs that we're about to sing this morning. Father, we need you every moment of every day. We need to walk with you and we need to remember the sacrifice that you made and we need to remember the promises that are ours. And Lord, I pray that as we sing these songs to you, as we open your word and we continue to preach from the book of Mark, that you would receive glory and honor and praise because those who are yours are honoring and praising and glorifying you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows My 
called by you to whatever vocation you call them to. And Father, I believe that Riley can be an example of Jesus Christ, even in the military. So Lord, I pray that you would strengthen her, that you would guide her, that you would help her. And Father, we pray that when she comes back from basic training, we'll be able to uh, hear some good stories and praise you for that. And then as she goes on to her schools and learns all the, the specialties that she's going to be a part of, that you'll bless her in the midst of that too, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Not a problem. Anybody ready for a sermon from Mark? Anybody learned anything from Mark? Isn't it amazing what we can learn when we open God's Word and we study it, when we read it, when we understand it? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I have no volume control this morning. My head has static in it. It's not ringing, it's just like static. Uh, from that, that antibiotic they gave me last year, it caused me to lose my hair. So if I start, you know, I can start, I can shout, stop, and split, you know that. If I get carried away and start just talking too loud, just let me know, you know. Calm me down a little bit um, because I can't hear myself. It was so hard to sing those songs this morning because I can't hear anything. Everything just sounds like you all are outside and I'm inside. And I can hear you, but I can't hear you. Uh, and it sounds like when I'm talking through my own mouth that I'm talking to myself with a little can with a string on. Anybody ever do that when you're a kid? Mm -hmm. That's just about what it sounds like this morning. So uh, please bear with me. How many of you have ever faced opposition before? Anybody? What kind of opposition have you ever faced? Somebody tell me uh, loudly so I can hear it with my deaf ears this morning. Something that you've been posed and wherever it might be. Anybody? A couple of you raised your hands. I mean, but when it says, okay, now tell me about it. Somebody else raised their hand too. All right, we won't belabor the point. Um, everywhere we go, it seems there's opposition. The opposition isn't always the same kind of opposition, though, is it? Sometimes you're fighting with a company that you're trying to get, like Tracy's been on the phone three weeks trying to get us a better internet connection here at the church so that we can get the camera that we're looking to buy and all the equipment we're looking to buy so that we can actually live stream on our website instead of having to use a couple cameras on Facebook. And we can't even get them to show up. There's been how many, five or six yeah. vans in the parking lot this week, but all they did was turn around. Everybody uses our parking lot for turnaround because you can't see going up Bell's Mill. So they come around and they go out the parking lot or they go down that way or they go another way. They don't ever stop when we keep trying. And she talked to three or four different people. You know, it seems like they're being our opponent right now because we pay the bill and then we want them to charge us more and they won't even call us back. Uh, it's crazy. Sometimes the devil is your opponent, right? Those Satan should love it. Anybody ever feel like the devil punched you back ever before? You know, maybe your neighbor becomes an opponent over a dispute over a fence or something like that or... There are just lots of opposition that comes our way. And a lot of times, the opposition that's in our life keeps us from accomplishing our own goals, but it also keeps us from accomplishing what God wants. Would anybody agree with me on that this morning? Yeah. It sure does. You know, and here's one of the things that I've learned. I grow more in times of opposition than I do when it's smooth, easy sailing. Anybody else? Because, number one, we're forced to rely on God. Number two, we have to look at who we are and determine whether I'm part of the problem. And so when we face different kinds of opposition, we have an opportunity for growth and we have an opportunity for even a stronger understanding of whatever it is that God's trying to, to, to teach us. So opposition comes in many forms. Uh, other times, it's well-meaning people who are trying to get you to refigure your ideas and plans. Have you ever come up with an idea and you start telling it to somebody and they already, even though they haven't even heard what you have to say, are already telling you what you're doing is wrong and they got a better idea? Build a better mousetrap than you can, right? Now, granted, if somebody's out there giving you some kind of crazy thing that they're thinking about doing, you're surely going to shut them down or try to shut them down or try to redirect them. When I felt God's call to go into the ministry all those years ago. 
You know, I saw, I saw a, uh, an anniversary picture on Facebook this week, and I asked Heather Meter if she was 12 years old when she got married. Did anybody see that picture? Doesn't she look like she's 12 years old? You know, Justin looks like a dirty old man standing there beside her. She's like a 12 year old kid. And, uh, you know, when Terry and I got married, we weren't quite that young. I did have a beard, but it wasn't like this. It was dark. Um, and I had a good job, and she had a job. And when God called me into the ministry, her dad hated the fact that I was walking away from a very lucrative job. And I had my own business, too, to go into the, the ministry to make nothing. <coughs> Um, back in the, let's see, I was 30, 28, when God straightened my life out, I was 30 when he, when he called me into the ministry, so I was, in 30 years, it would have been 1990, 90, early 1990s, um, I left my own career, plus her job, plus me having a, a business on the side, making over $100,000 a year, and the very first year we were in the ministry, we made $18,000. You talk about lifestyle adjustment, but none of us ever needed food, and God always provided. I mean, there were times when there was no money in the bank account, and there was bills to be paid, and all of a sudden, Terry would go out and get the mail, and she'd say, look here, here's a card that nobody signed, it's got no return address on it, and sometimes it was for the exact amount of money that we needed to pay our bills. And we didn't tell anybody what we owed. You see, God takes care of us, but her dad did not like the fact that I was leaving, taking his daughter, who I had just married, you know, a while before that, and uh, taking her and putting her in a position where she was not going to maybe be taken care of. Because Siri, when I married Terry, she might not look as young as Heather did, but she had the safety net. I mean, they were the typical Midwestern family in the little cottage-sized house. Dad had a good job that paid for a long time, all the long time her and uh, her mom and dad were married. They went and did whatever they wanted to do. They could afford to do it. Terry never even stayed home by herself until she was 18 years old. And then I showed up. <laughs> you know, I don't think he cared for me much to start with because when I said, can I marry your daughter? He said, no. <laughs> so I thought it was a good plan. And he said, no. <laughs> you know, people will try to stop your plans. And as we have spent the last 38 years together, it's been a pretty amazing journey. And as we think about it, you know, sometimes we do have plans that maybe we've not thought through and we need to get counsel. But if you've thought through it, you're thinking you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. If somebody gives you your, their, their opinion, you have the right to hear it or not hear it. Does that make sense to everybody? You don't have to do something just because somebody else says something. You know, that's why all of you mothers who are controlling in the relationships that your kids are in, cut the apron string, strings and step out. They let them work it out. Let them figure it out. You know, most of what I learned in life is by banging my head against the wall. Anybody else? <laughs> you can only bang your head against the wall so long until you go find the door and get yourself out of there. And so we have to think about that. Now, you know, we're talking about Jesus today. We're going to talk about some of the opposition that he faced. And sometimes there's the real possibility of spiritual opposition. Now, if we were Pentecostal people who see a demon behind every bush, and we know that there's a spirit of this and a spirit of that and a spirit of that, do you know that those demonic spirits that people talk about, just like the devil, they can only be in one place at one time. They are not omnipresent like Jesus is, like God is. So, you know, somebody says, we're going to cast the spirit of this or that out of this person. Well, how do you know that's what's going on there? How do they know? They see a demon behind every bush, but there is real spiritual warfare that goes on in our world today, isn't there? Yes. The Bible says we don't struggle against each other. We don't struggle against flesh and blood. There's always some kind of spiritual forces working in between us. That's what breaks down marriages. You know, people take their eyes off God. And evil evil is, a, is allowed to infect the marriage. That's what happens in relationships. It's what happens all over the world that we find ourselves in. So, there's opposition from people, there's opposition from circumstances, there's opposition from evil. We all face those things. So did Jesus. Do you know that he came to be a man so he could experience the things that we experience? So we have God we can identify with. Does anybody believe that? He did. It says in Philippians chapter 2, he took his deity and he set some of those aspects of his deity aside 
so they could experience true humanity, but he never ceased being God. And so as we think about it, we're going to read Mark 3, 20 through 30 today. We're going to break it up into smaller chunks. Last week when we were here, we were talking about how Jesus chose some unlikely people to be his leaders among the followers, correct? That's what we talked about last week. Not everybody can be a follower. Not everybody can be a leader. And one thing that I failed to say last week that I need to remind you of this week is if you haven't ever looked back over your shoulder and nobody's following you, guess what? You're not a leader. Have you ever been in a classroom full of little kids and the teacher says, who wants to be the leader today? Woo! And your hand goes up, right? Everybody wants to be the leader. Why? Because everybody wants that recognition. Can I tell you that some of the best leaders that have ever existed in the world have been those who have led as servants. Without the glitz, without the glamour, without anything else, they've just been steady in their walk with God. They've been steady in their understanding of what God desires, and they help people understand who Jesus is. So this morning, let's read a couple verses here. One time, verse 20 of chapter 3 of the book of Mark, one time Jesus entered the house, and the crowds began to gather again. Every time Jesus goes to somebody's house, they get invaded, don't they? I mean, people are in the house, they're around the house, they're looking through the windows, they're hanging out the doorways, they're on the porches, everywhere else. Soon, he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. Let me tell you, I've been in ministry situations when it wasn't what we've had over the last year, when I was running six, seven days a week doing college ministry, ministry here, men's ministry, everything else. There's been times when I got all the way through the day and figured out I didn't need anything. Have you ever had one of those days? You just get so busy problem solving, you get so busy trying to figure it out, you get so busy trying to work them down to where you can overcome it, and you starve to death, and you don't know why you have a headache, you don't know why your belly hurts, and then you stop and say, well, man, all I had was some cheese crackers last night, and I haven't had anything else since then. I must be hungry. But let me ask you this. How many of you, when you get hungry, get hangry? H-A-N-G-R-Y. Anybody? Oh, yeah. So these guys are working. They're doing what God wants them to do. Jesus is working. That's why I remember what we say several weeks ago. Sometimes he had to get off away from everybody and get by himself so that he could commune with the Father and be strengthened and continue to do what he was doing. So we look at the next verse. It says, when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. Now, this is the Son of God. Jesus grew up in this family, and they are telling the people, let's get him out of here. He's out of his mind. And what's another way to say he's out of his mind? He's crazy. He's nuts. Right? Well, as we think about this, his biological family, um, he had two different types of opposition in his popular ministry. In verses 20 to 21, there's a well-meant but misguided interference on the part of his family. Can I tell you why they, they're trying to say this? We've already learned that Jesus healed two different people on two different Sabbaths. And what were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes looking to do? They wanted to kill him, right? And they, his family, were afraid that they might have to deal with some of the fallout of that. What would happen in our world today if parents got punished for their kids being out looting and burning everything down last summer? You think it would have stopped after about the first time somebody was out there doing that? Absolutely it would. Yeah, it would. And there are times in the history of our world when people were punished for what their family did. The whole family got punished for it. And when the Jews had their Pharisees, Sadducees, and all those running the church, they had an absolute iron fist of control on the people. And they were scared to death of them. They were scared of the religious leaders. Should you ever be scared of somebody who's leading you? Should you ever be afraid of them? No, you shouldn't be afraid of them. You should have confidence in them. You should hope that they're doing the best they can to help you to become everything you need to be. Um, I'm sure, Riley, when you go down there, there's going to be somebody who's going to get nose to nose with you. And you can't do that. You're not going to have to get that smile going, girl. You're going to have to get rid of it. You're going to have to learn how to be a blank sheet of paper, just like that. Okay? Just got to take it away. What are you laughing at? 
That's where he gets the power to cast out demons. Jesus called them over and he responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. If a, ki a kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. So he's talking about the Pharisees and he's talking about his own family and he's including Satan being a part of both of those things. Do you see that? Satan is the one causing his family to come and distract him. Satan is the one who these religious teachers are trying to give him credit for. Let me ask you a question. It's kind of a dumb question. But does Satan want to defeat Satan? No, Satan wants Satan to do everything Satan can do to get Satan to get where he wants to be, right? That's why he rebelled against God in the first place. And if Jesus is casting these demons out that are affecting people and the people are becoming whole, why would Satan want that? He allowed that to happen in the first place so he could destroy those people's lives. You see, these religious people, they're out of answers, so they just start name-calling. Have you ever been in that situation before? <laughs> you can try to talk to someone. Look at what's going on in the conversations that are going on in our world today. You say something immediately. You're a racist. You're a homophobic. You're a xenophobe. You're a hate monger. You're this. You're that. Just because you're presenting your point in an argument. We've lost the ability to have civil discourse in our world today. Everything is answered with that kind of an answer. And people name call all the time, don't they? If somebody doesn't like something you say and they don't have a rebuttal, they'll just call you something. Um, you know, I like to tell people once in a while, hey, next time you wave up, you use all your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> because that's how people respond. They respond out of anger. They respond to try to make you look bad. They try to make you look like something you're not. And let's keep on reading here. He says, if Satan is, is, is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Jesus said, if those things don't help you understand it, let me tell you something else. <laughs> he says, who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Well, I'll tell you what, if somebody ever wants my stuff more than I want my stuff, and they, they value my stuff more than they value their life, they're going to find out what happens if I break into my house. <laughs> okay? Uh, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Now, there was malicious opposition from these Jewish leaders. Malicious opposition. I mean, the worst thing that you could do in that day was to call somebody a devil. Does anybody remember what happened in the 1600s in New, in New England? What was the worst thing anybody could do to somebody then? Call them a witch. Call them a witch. And it didn't matter whether they were a witch or they weren't a witch. They were automatically guilty of being a witch. And they did all kinds of things. To show that they were witches, you know, it was a humiliating thing for the women. They would make them stand naked in front of a bunch of men, and they would examine them for Satan's mark. And if they couldn't find out they still believed they were witch, they'd try to drown them. They'd, try, they'd, they'd go torture to get them to tell why they followed Satan and how they got in this situation with Satan. To call somebody Satan in Jesus' day was the ultimate slam. The ultimate, nastiest, most hurtful thing that you could say to anybody was to call them a devil. Okay? And so as we unpack this just a little bit, in verse 22, the religious leaders claim that Jesus is possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. Okay? Most people, they don't even believe there is Satan. They don't believe there is a Lucifer. Do you know that Lucifer is one of the archangels? There was... Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer. Lucifer was the number one guy. Okay? He was the most beautiful thing that God ever created. Isn't it amazing how he uses the most beautiful things that we seek after and we lust after to dangle them in front of us to get us to do what he wants us to do? You see, Satan is not against Satan. He's all for and as many as he can because he knows the only way he can hurt God is to steal God's precious people away from him. Jesus didn't die for the angels. Jesus died for us. And every one of us that Satan can tempt and trick and cause to stumble through whatever means it takes, 
with every power that's in this world, powers, principalities, rulers in dark places and in heavenly places, he would use them to try to get people to fall away from God. And like I said, that's the worst plan that you can possibly get. Then he gives illustration after illustration, and we've been through those. And then he hard, he asks them hard questions. How can Satan fight against himself? Now, let me ask you a question. None of us knew how you could fight against yourself until you saw about the last 15 minutes of Fight Club. Anybody remember the movie Fight Club? You thought everybody was there and they were all fighting against each other, right? And it's this guy fighting against himself. And as we think about that, how often do we fight against ourselves? How often are you your own worst enemy? How often? Daily? Weekly? Monthly? When the hard stuff comes, we can be our own worst enemy. We listen to the lies that people have told us all of our lives, that we won't amount to anything, that we'll never get past this, that nobody cares what we have to say, that we're ugly, that, you know, all that kind of stuff. So therefore, somewhere down the road, somebody came up with one of these sayings, I'm fat, you're ugly, I can lose weight. <laughs> right? There's always a way to combat somebody saying negative things to you. And it didn't help, and it doesn't make you look any better, but we always have something that we've believed that keeps us from becoming who we can be. Do you know that the American dream still exists in America today? If you work hard and you save your money and you make responsible choices, you can pretty much be anything you want to be in the United States. But there's a lie out there being told and disseminated by the devil that only certain people can be that. But then you start picking up. Has anybody ever seen the show The Resident? Anybody ever seen the, the show The Resident? It's on Netflix. It's about this young doctor, and it's about corporate hospitals, and how corporate hospitals don't care about anybody. They only care about the bottom line, and how many crooked things they do, and what they do, and some of the things they have to deal with. Well, you know, last week when Terry and I sat down and watched one episode of it together, it's actually on Hulu. We watched it on Hulu because we don't have cable. Um, it was all about COVID, and one of the doctors, young doctor's dad, died from COVID. You know, and it was all the COVID propaganda that we heard for a whole 15 months was all packed into a one-hour show. Well, guess what? The whole BLM message and all that kind of stuff was packed into the one I watched last night from the very beginning where a black doctor who is dirty and does what he shouldn't do and lies and cheats and only cares about the money that goes in his pockets is confronted by a young black doctor they are both at the top of their field and the other one accuses him of having no integrity and all this kind of stuff and then the, one, the black doctor that did the wrong things looked at the other black doctor and said, dude, you're racist. Think about that. He knows he did it wrong and the other guy who was trying to do it right and has ended up fixing about five of his mistakes in a row comes up and says, listen buddy, he said, you're wrong. There is something wrong with you. You need to do something different. He says, why are we sitting together, brother? You know how the world looks on us. There's only a couple of us who can make it. And when we make it, we'll still be dropped at any moment just because of the melatonin in our skin. And the other young doctor's looking at him going, no, nah, dude, you got me wrong. You're wrong. What you did is wrong. It happens among every people group. Why do we need an Asian hate crime? Asians are human beings, aren't they? But they're being attacked by another group of people right now. It's awful. Why can't we all just be human beings? Why can't we all just care about each other? Because most of the world doesn't know Christ. And most of the world is operating under the auspices of Satan. Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 that if you live a life of constant habitual sin, it proves that you belong to the devil. And God is not in you or near you. So we see this, and Jesus asks some hard questions, and they just go to name call, and they just go to spurting out things that are awful. Next, he answers for them. And he gives several illustrations in verses 24 to 27 about family fighting against itself, can't stand. You know, families in our world are falling apart, aren't they? They are falling apart everywhere we look. 
families are falling apart. And these are religious elites. Now, and I'm going to tie this one in. You hear me tying it in already, don't you? These religious elites, they think they got all the answers and they know it all, but they don't know anything. And how many of you know that the elites in our world today couldn't fight their way out of a paper bag? They couldn't find their way out of the bathroom if somebody opened the door up for them. They couldn't stand in front of a three-way mirror and hit their butt with both hands. How about that one? I'll give you three illustrations just like Jesus did. Maybe mine are a little different than his. Elites, they're the people who think they know it all. They've got it all figured out. Most teenagers start out as elites. And the older they get, the dumber they realize they are. And eventually they come to their parents and say, I wasn't very smart, and you're a lot smarter than me. Can you help me out? And thank God we stick around and say, yep, I'm still here. I've been waiting on you to figure it out. I've been trying to tell you all along, but here we go. We'll walk through this together. You know, just like the other night, I'm sitting in my chair. It's hot, sunny afternoon. My darling little daughter picks up the phone and says, Daddy, what are you doing right now? I said, well, I'm sitting here trying to rest my arm. <coughs> she says, some guy just totaled my car. And, of course, I'm jumping out of the chair. And, make, and the first question is, where was it? Are you in it? That kind of stuff. Well, I'm sitting in front of my house. And he just drove down the street and didn't pay attention. And he hit the back of my car and pushed the bumper clear up to the back glass. I'm going to tell you what, a Toyota for a uh, robot. Uh, what? Cameron. Cameron. Yeah, Toyota can take a hit. Toyota can take a hit. Because he hit her about 30 miles an hour. Luckily, she wasn't sitting in the car. She was sitting on the couch. But how about you as parents? When you hear something like that, what's the first thing you do? I've got to find out. got to get the information. got to figure it out, right? And I knew she'd never been through something like that before. I said, I'll be right there. So we went over and cops were there, fire trucks were there. And I mean, he hit her and moved her about from where I'm sitting to where Gary's sitting back there, about two-thirds of the way back through the church. That's how hard he hit her car and moved her. It was parked up the street while she was mowing because she was turning her lawnmower around in the driveway to go back and cut the next swipe, and it pushed her. And I mean, you could see where he hit it, and it pushed the frame down, and the frame dug into blacktop. There were no slowdown marks for him at all. Wow. 30 miles an hour. He was on the sidewalk when he hit her because the driver, the passenger side of his car hit her car on the driver's side, and her driver's side was on the curb. You know, when we look at those kind of things and we think about it and we, and we see that, that was something she'd never been before, through before. And it was an honor that my daughter, who thank God didn't get hurt, and the guy got out of the car going kind of like this because the airbag blew up in his face. That's how fast he was going. She called me and said, Daddy, can you come out? That's an awesome thing. Most kids today, they don't want their parents to tell them or help them with anything. I had to have a little conversation with another little young man in our church this week who wasn't quite listening to his parents. And I had to sit down right where he was sitting. I made him look at me and I said, how about this? And I gave him about 47 illustrations, didn't I? About what he was doing and why he shouldn't be doing it and how if he did this differently, it would change. Now, most kids, when I'm talking to them, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> okay, whatever you say. I hope some of it's stuck. Right? And as we think about it and we look at this, we need each other. We don't need to be splitting each other up. We need to walk with each other, care about each other. We need to do those kind of things. And the religious elite, they only care about themselves. The political elite only care about themselves. Do you notice how they all speak the same language and say the exact same thing? Nobody's allowed to deviate from the conversation. Bullet points. Boom, 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 boom. Whether it's the media arm of the, of the political party, or whether it's the politicians themselves, they all say the same thing. It's like the Pentecostal preachers in the faith movement who all preach each other's sermons. Do you know how Kenneth Copeland learned how to preach? He listened to Kenneth Hagin's sermons, memorized them, and preached them verbatim the way that that guy preached them. That's what goes on in our world today. Nobody's thinking for themselves. Nobody cares about themselves. They just want to look good in what they're doing. And evil can never destroy evil because then its power would be thinned down. Let me ask you, 
Because our world today, with all the chaos and all the confusion and all the ugliness that's going on, becoming more and more evil or less and less evil. Hello? I can't hear you. Remember, I'm not listening today. More and more, more, and more evil. So if the devil's fighting against himself out there, why aren't unicorns flying by and farting rainbows? <laughs> so that we can all be entertained. Why do we have to see people killed in the streets? Why do we have to see somebody's life torn apart? Why do we have to see that? Because the devil loves that kind of stuff. And if you don't believe me, the great theologians, Don Henley and Glenn Fry, sang a song that said this, the bubble-headed bleach blonde comes on in five. She can tell you about the plane crash. With a gleam in her eye, people love it. Dirty laundry, right? Anybody remember that old evil song, Dirty Laundry? It's about how you never hear good stuff, you only hear bad stuff, and if you only hear bad stuff, the devil's winning. That's why we who have a testimony need to share it. We need to tell people what God's doing in our lives. We don't need to let anybody distract us while we're doing it, okay? Now, next couple verses, and we'll be finished with this chapter and we'll be done for the day. Then Jesus' mother, in verse 31, and his brothers came to see him. They stood outside and sent word for him to come out and talk with them. Now, they were there before. They must have left, and now they came back and brought mom with them. Because mom makes things happen, right? <clears throat> There was a crowd sitting around Jesus, and someone said, Your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Um, you know, just to back up to that last section and give you guys a couple of these blanks, so I know everybody's all tense about throwing these blanks in. That which is divided is easily destroyed, and power is required to overcome that which seems strong. Those were part of those illustrations that Jesus gave. And Jesus' reasoning for overcoming those people was to show their ignorance. They had all the answers, but they didn't know anything. Does that make sense? And then Jesus' family comes back again. It's like Jesus can't get a break. His brothers come and bother him, and then the Pharisees come and bother him. And now the brothers are back, and they've got mom with them. Because they want him out of there. They don't want him digging their hole way deeper, making it any harder on them than what he's already made it on them. And he's not there to do that. He's there to help people understand who God is. Isn't he? Isn't that why the church exists? Why does the church have such a bad name? Why is it such so hard for people to believe that church people, God's people, you know, well, let me back up and stop that right there. There's a difference between church people and God's people. Anybody agree with me on that? Yes. They're a way big difference. There are a lot of church people sitting in dead buildings where nothing's happening and God hadn't moved in forever. And there are a lot of God's people who are gathered together to worship God and honor God and see God work. Aren't you glad you're part of the latter group? Yes. Yep. Yep, yep. All right, now Jesus' family is trying to interfere with his ministry again, verses 31 to 35. We've already read part of that. We read their part. All right? His mother and brother came to see him. They stood outside. They sent work for him to come out and talk with them. Uh, they're going to try to talk some sense into Jesus. They're going to try to get him on the right path. Oh, my gosh. They didn't know any more than the religious people did, do they? No. And then somebody says, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. Jesus replied, who is my mother? Have you ever seen that little book? Are you my mother? <laughs> are you my mother? The little creature who walks around and talks to everybody and every other animal in the barn and are you my mother? No, I'm not your mother. No, I'm not your mother. Um, I've heard a lot of kids say, you're not my mother, you can't tell me what to do. <laughs> I bet there might be somebody in the room that tried that one time, just before you had to duck. <laughs> right? And some of you knew better than to ever let that word come out of your mouth because you knew that after mom got done with you, dad was coming home from work and he's going to have a piece of you too. You know, if our parents in the world today discipline their kids the way kids got disciplined in my generation, the world will be a different place. They don't need timeouts. Sometimes they need a knockout. <laughs> and I don't mean that literally. I mean they need the Board of Education to fly to the seat of knowledge, not just stand in a corner. 
parents don't even, they, they blame everybody else but themselves for what's going on with their kids today. They blame the school. If their kids fail in school, they blame the school because the school didn't do their job. Well, it doesn't matter that the parent wasn't there helping while the, I mean, I guess, I don't know, I said this to the guys on Tuesday night, I've always been a classic overachiever. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate the overachiever? The one who always sets the curve in the classroom? Didn't you hate that when you're going to school? Let me tell you, before I went to kindergarten, I could spell hippopotamus. <coughs> and I could read it. I wasn't just a little parrot that mimicked the words. I could spell hippopotamus. I could read it before I went to kindergarten. Okay? You know why? Because somebody sat down with me and took the time to do that. And then somebody said, once we get all this technology, we'll have all this extra time on our hands, and we'll really be able to invest in our kids. So what do we do? We have technology. We give our kids technology. We do our stuff. We get lost on Pinterest ladies for hours and hours and hours. And guys get lost on marketplace and fishing websites and all that, and hunting websites for hours and hours and hours. And your kids are looking at stuff. And then they say, you can't look at my phone to see what I was looking at. I have rights. No, you're 12. I bought the phone. I'm going to look at the phone and see what's on the phone. Nobody today really spends a lot of time with their kids. Because everybody's so busy chasing after their own stuff. Jesus said, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Well, he knew their names. We know at least two of them. Right? Jude wrote the one chapter book of Jude in the New Testament. And James, the one who wrote the book of James and who became the leader in the church in Jerusalem after Jesus was crucified, put in the ground, and resurrected from the dead. You see, they did not believe who Jesus was. They didn't believe him. If you don't believe that, I'm going to give you the scripture. I'm not going to go there today for time's sake. Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 to 39. They did not believe in Jesus. They didn't. Until after he was crucified. As a matter of fact, they tried in that, in that little passage, they tried to send Jesus to a place where he would get hurt on purpose. Hard to believe, isn't it? Look, these are my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and my mother and my sister. Think about that. This is probably one of the hardest things that Jesus taught about. Other than blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which we didn't hit very hard as we were looking at that in the, in the paragraph before. Two of the hardest things that Jesus ever talked about are right here in this chapter. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is when those leaders were trying to attribute what God did to the devil. Anybody that attributes what God does to the devil is guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now, the ultimate blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is for somebody to make it all the way through their life and deny that there's a God and deny that there's a Holy Spirit and deny that they're a sinner and die without God. That's the ultimate blasphemy. The Bible says there's no forgiveness for that, none whatsoever. And if you want to read that, it's in John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. John chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. I'm not going to go there today giving you a little bit of homework to read up. If you have questions, you're welcome to contact me by Facebook or contact me by text message or whatever. Send me an email. I'll work you through it, walk you through it. Maybe you can give you a couple other scriptures. But the two hardest things that we under we don't understand a lot about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit except what Jesus said. And here's the deal. I've had people come to me in all these years of ministry and they've said, I'm afraid that I've blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. I've fallen from grace. I've walked away from God. And you know what my answer to them is? If you're worried about it, you didn't do it. It's the people who don't worry about it, that don't have any inter inner longing to know whether they're all right with God or not, who are maybe in the process of committing that kind of sin. A little quick story. When I was a teenager, I went down here to Central Assemblies right after they moved from Johnson and Lee Street to their new building. So that tells you how long ago that's been. It's not a new building anymore. <laughs> been there for a long time. Um, the pastor there, Ken Owen, told the story. Uh, when he was a young man in ministry, uh, a lady at his church was worried about her husband. He was dying from lung cancer. I mean, he had he was, there was no hope for him. He was terminal. And she said, would you go talk to my husband? 
And he said, well, I don't know your husband. Does he want to talk to me? Just like I said a while ago. You know, nobody wants to talk to somebody they don't know if they're going to try to make them change their mind. They'll change their mind. He said, he, well, I'm going to tell him you're coming. He said, it's all right if you come. Well, while he was there, he was talking to him about his need for God and how, you know, here you are at the end of your life and God's given you a chance. Your wife asked me to come here and I'd like to talk to you about a relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd like to talk to you about asking God to forgive you for all the things that you did wrong while you... You know, we don't know how much longer you have. Um, and the man said, you know what, preacher? He said, I'm glad you came and all, but I got a pack of cigarettes right in there in that coat pocket in that closet. Would you get me one? I'd like to smoke one. I don't want to talk about that. I want to smoke cigarettes. Do you know that the story goes that a day or two later he fell into a coma and he died? That's the ultimate rejection of God, to reject God for one more cigarette. To not be willing to accept Christ as your Savior because you want that thing in this world more. Now, I'm not going to get up here and do a big old tirade on smoking. Okay? That's a personal choice. It's a health thing. you got to deal with that. The point of the story is that man blasphemed God by choosing a cigarette and refusing to confess his sins over having eternal life. That's ultimate blasphemy. But anybody who attributes what God's doing to the devil or to coincidence or things like that. Have you ever said God did something in your life and somebody said, well, that's a good coincidence. There are no coincidences where God's concerned. Anybody believe that? None. None at all. Okay, well, let's look at this. Jesus' family is trying to interfere with his ministry. They want him to walk away from the tension in the room and get their counsel. None of them are very smart, are they? No. And here's where I fall on this. Verses 33 to 35, when Jesus said, My brothers, my sister, and my mother are those who do the will of God. Here we go. I believe, I believe what Jesus said. Terry and I lived away from our families for a thousand, um, at least a thousand miles for most of the time we were married before we moved back here. Our family was a church family. And you know, just because you share genetic material with somebody does not make that bond stronger than your relationship with somebody who believes in Jesus the way you believe in Jesus. Anybody believe that? Yes. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 that if you, you know, he came to bring division between mother and daughter and son and father and daughter-in-law and mother-in-law. Why? Because of the truth of the gospel. Being a believer in a family of unbelievers will ostracize you from them faster than anything else in the world. Ask me, I know I've been a part of it all my life. I am a firm believer that my family is my godly family. Now, I will do anything for anybody that's part of my family that needs my help. But my bonds to my family in Christ are way tighter, stronger, and more enduring than my bonds with my genetic family. And you're looking at me like, oh. But see, here, here's what happens. When you witness to people who don't belong to Christ, who don't believe the way you do, that are part of your family, they'll cut you out. They don't want to hear it. But here's what I found. There's people who belong to God, and they, there's something going on in their life. How can, how can we work on this? Will you pray for me? Will you, can I help you with this? You know, let's, let's go through this together. And uh, I'm Taylor, the man sitting right there. We've been through thick and thin together over the past 16 years. Closer than a brother. So much so that he's Uncle Steve to both my kids. Now think about that. They don't talk about their Aunt Who or Uncle Who. It's Uncle Steve. And you know, neither one of us is perfect. And when the two of us get together, it's not perfect. <laughs> Let me tell you, he's got all the flaws, and I can't figure it out. <laughs> you know, it's just like me and Terry. We have a strange and wonderful relationship. She's strange and I'm wonderful. <laughs> but when we love people who love us back and we have Christ in common, 
It is a way much stronger bond. And you know what? Too many people who belong to Jesus are watching people that they're genetically related to sin and blaspheme against God. And they're not willing to open their mouth up about it because they're afraid they'll offend them. Do you know what you're going to do? One of these days, if you don't speak out and don't plant a seed and they don't hear it, they could very well end up in hell. Had Jesus' brothers not believed in him after the resurrection, they would have been in hell. But we know at least two of them became strong followers. James was martyred for the cause of Christ. Okay? And we need to make sure that our bonds in our church family are strong. And we need to pray for those people that are part of our genetic families who refuse Christ. But what did Jesus say? They come in here, they say, he's nuts, he's crazy, we got to get him out of here, come out here and talk to us, we don't want you getting us into your trouble. And Jesus had to leave Nazareth and leave that area because he couldn't even do miracles because of the opposition from his family. And he turned around and he said this, he said, a prophet has no honor in his own country. People know who you are when you're related to them. And they think you're better than them when you start talking about God and those kind of things. Well, we don't go any further than that, but spiritual bonds are thicker than blood as far as I'm concerned. Uh, anyone who does God's will is my family. Anyone who does God's will is my family. I have a big family. I do. So let me ask you this, who in your family, this is a hard question, who in your family, your blood relative, is keeping you from accomplishing God's will? Who in your family are you afraid to talk about Jesus to? Who in your family wants to go to spit and fight you when you ask to pray or when you get involved with those kind of things? Who in your family is living a life of blatant, habitual sin and you know it? And, they, and you've seen it, and they probably even know they are too, but they don't, nobody says anything to them about it. Hmm? Let me tell you, those people will cut you off faster than anybody in the world. Don't judge me, man. Who do you think you ought to judge me? Well, you know, don't be like everybody else in the world. We are supposed to be like Christ. We're supposed to care about each other, love each other, and live a life of righteousness and holiness. As we trust in God, I almost said to the best of our ability, but guess what? To the best of our ability, all of our righteousness is what to God? Filthy rags. we got to put on the garment of Christ. we got to put on His righteousness. we got to live for Him. Jesus showed that to His family members. He showed that to the religious people. And neither one of them liked it. So if your best buddies, if everybody's out there drunken and drink, drinking and drugging and running around and running around on their wives and and you know all that's going on, and that's the crowd that's your best friends, you need to go look in the mirror and ask God who you are. Now, you need to be in their lives so you can help them understand who God is and point out what's wrong. But as soon as you say something, as soon as you open your mouth, just get ready. Because opposition is going to come. Who are you afraid of at work? But you can't talk about God. To somebody who needs to hear about God. I'm not telling you to use your work time to do evangelism. Build friendships with those people. Talk to them outside of work. Talk to them on break. Talk to them on next time. Help them understand who God is. If you win one of them over, my God, the Bible says that the angels dance back and forth in front of heaven, in front of God, for every soul that's saved. And here's what I do. I've been doing this for a long time. I pray that God will send somebody to the people that I was born into that family and help them understand who Jesus is. Because they won't hear it from me. I was never allowed to talk to my brother when I moved back here. He was a drug addict. He was an alcoholic. He took a pill to get up in the morning and smoked a joint so he could go to work. And he had his own business making all kinds of money. And just like Bill Gates and his wife show, money doesn't buy happiness. And he drank a case of beer every night. He stayed stoned all the time. And then one day somebody couldn't pay him, so they gave him crack cocaine. And he started smoking crack cocaine. And the crack cocaine got the best of him. And he came to my house one day. He was just like this. And I wanted to talk to him. And they said, don't you talk to him. He'll get mad. He won't come back around. 
Well, guess what? He committed suicide. Nobody gets to talk to him now. He's in hell because he rejected God all his life. My own brother. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. They don't want to hear it, and other people in the family don't want you to talk to them either because then they're not their best friend either. Can I tell you what? I'd rather be somebody they're angry with if they'll listen to Jesus than to be their best friend and watch them end up in hell for eternity. How about you? We got to get busy, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. There's a world going to hell every day all around us. We know them. We love them. We care about them. They won't hear from us. So go find somebody else and start talking to them. And you know what? Hold on close to your church family. Because when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Right? When we all see Jesus, We'll sing and shout the victory. And the Bible says that there's no tears in heaven. And we won't have time to think about those who are left behind and those who didn't accept Christ. God's going to shield us from that. But while we're in the earth, our hearts ought to be broken. And we ought to speak the truth in love. And I'm going to tell you, when you speak the truth in love, they're still going to shove it right back at you. But that doesn't mean you don't try. And guess what? You may have to answer to God one of these days. So I gave you that chance. I'm going to give you that chance. I'm going to give you that chance. And there's not going to be any tears because you didn't take a chance. He's just going to explain to you, look, I helped you. You could have done so much more. But you're here. We're going to have to look at our lives. And the Bible says we're going to be judged for every idle word that comes out of our mouths, every thought that comes out of our, uh, our minds. Who is it that you're afraid to talk to about Jesus because they won't like you anymore? Because let me tell you, if you're offering them the best gift that the world ever offered through Christ, they're not your friend anyhow if they don't want Christ. They're conditional based on you allowing them to be who they want to be and never say anything about it. Two of the hardest teachings in the Bible right there. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and who is my family? Who is my real family? Now some of you are looking at me like, Pastor Ron, I'm not sure I agree with you. I know my family. Yeah, I love mine too. But I have to speak out. And I have to tell them the truth. And I have to let them know that God's not okay with what's going on. Just like when somebody calls me that's not part of my family, and they say, hey, we'd like for you to marry us. And I say, well, what church do you go to? Well, we don't go to church. <laughs> well, why are you calling me then? I don't just sign paperwork for the state. I require godly premarital counseling. Well, I'm not doing that. Okay. Call somebody else. Go to Justice and Peace. They sign papers for the state and they don't care whether you believe in God or not. And I gave that to a family member recently and I was told where to get off and not to ever bother them again. If you're not going to live for God, why would you make vows in front of God? They got absolutely torqued and said they don't ever want to see me again. They don't ever talk to me again. But you know what? I've talked to people who didn't know Jesus, who were willing to go through the, member, the counseling. One of them might have been a believer at one time, kind of slipped off. I've seen people who go through that counseling and they come to Christ. And they understand they need a relationship with Jesus to make marriage work. When you tell people who are honestly looking for the truth, the truth, they'll accept it and they'll change their lives. And we've got to do that. But everywhere we look, there's opposition. Isn't there? we got to get over the opposition that's in our own mind first that tells us, oh, you can't say that. They'll be mad at you. They'll never talk to you again. They don't want to be your friend no more. <laughs> I don't want to be friends with people who don't want to do what God wants. I'll be acquaintances with them. Because there's a difference between being a friend and an acquaintance, isn't there? A friend loves the person who they interact with and wants the best for them. An acquaintance just says, hey, let's go have fun. Sit down, shut up, hold on, here we go. So what do you going to do about that this week? Talk about the hard stuff. They may not like you for it, but you know what? God honors those who speak for him. And it's not your job to convince them it's just your job to put the seed there. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord. I pray that you would 
speak to our hearts and help us to realize that sometimes those people that we are born into a family of will drag us away from you faster than anything or cause us to keep our mouth shut faster about who you are than anything else in the world. And Father, we also know that there are people that we know who are blaspheming the Holy Spirit every day of their lives. They just live like God doesn't exist. And we just go along with them and don't ever say, hey, you know, God's not okay with that. And Jesus really did die for you. And God really does love you. And, and if you would just open your heart to listen to what the Bible says and what God wants, you could change your whole outlook on life. And those people go all the way to their grave and they don't care. And they don't, they're just blaspheming against God. And, and we never said anything because we were afraid they might not like us. God, we pray that you would help us in this world that we live in to be victor victorious as you overcome the evil that affects our world because your people are faithful to speak out for you. God, we need you, we love you, we care for you. And we want other people to come to you. And we thank you that you do give us, like the old song, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed at the fountain cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. I thank you for the church family here at Cumberland Community Church, for the love that we share for one another, for the hospitality that we show one another, for the way that we can serve each other. And Lord, I pray that we will become stronger in every one of those aspects as we think about what Jesus said. Who is my real family? My real family are those who do my Father's will. That is hard for us to overcome in this world that we live in today. We don't speak to our kids that are living together because they're doing it just because everybody else is doing it when they should be married before they do that. We don't talk to young people who get pregnant before they get pregnant and help them understand that, that you get it out of order when you're not married first. But it seems like everybody in the world is getting pregnant and then they decide to get married or they live together or they don't ever get married. And we didn't want to see those grandkids, so we don't dare say something that would hurt somebody's little feelings. But God, one day we're going to stand in front of you for all those opportunities and all those things we didn't do that we should have. And the one thing that keeps me on track is your word says, and James, to those who know what they ought to do and they don't do it, to them it is sin. God, thank you that we can be positive influences that we can love each other, and that there's still the people that need you. And if we're faithful, you'll point us in that direction, and we'll help them understand how they can be part of a family that will love them, accept them for who they are, and help them to become everything that you want them to be. In Jesus' name I pray.